Welcome to Creeping It Real. I am Judah. Today I'd like to discuss a movie that I like to say fits in the subgenre of horror. We're going to call it the snobby hipster horror. That movie is, in fact, Skinnamarink. Skinnamarink was brought to my attention by my beloved cousin, Brianna. She lives in California. She came to visit the Midwest. We hung out. I let her know about my uh, podcast. She told me that she loves horror movies, and we started exchanging movies that we should watch. Uh, we came to discover that I prefer the campy, fun stuff, and she prefers the uh, snobby, hipster-type things, foreign, you know, stuff that isn't really fun. But what are you going to do? She suggested to get him a rink who was suggested to her by her brother, my other cousin, Corey. So thanks to Corey as well. She visited back in November and she was like, you got to check this movie out. I went home to see where it could stream from. It was on shutter. I had to subscribe. I started watching it. I, I messaged her. I said, okay, I'm starting to watch skin and rink. And she said to me, okay, this, this is a tough movie. You're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. There's no in-between. And I'm like, eh, okay, whatever. And she said, and you have to watch it in the dark, in silence, no distractions, and you have to be in the mindset of a child. And I said, I'll give it a try. Started watching this movie. <sighs> Before I get into this, let's let's do a little little set up here. And th this is supposed to be a review of Skin and Brink, and, and we'll get to it. I love hiking. I go out to different national parks, and I pick out uh, the hardest trails that I feel that I can do with my personal, you know, stamina and so forth. And if I need to, I train. Some of these trails are beautiful the whole way through. And there's nothing in but enjoyment the whole time. And some of, uh, some of them are just like really difficult. But when you get to the end, there's an amazing payoff. And there's a lot of people who are unable to or refused re to take that trip to make it to that beauty. But that trip and that hardship to make it to that beauty sometimes makes it even more worthwhile knowing that you're part of the few that made it there to see this beauty. I'm getting somewhere. I'm getting somewhere. So I'm setting up the idea that sometimes working hard through things that are like detestable to get to an end that reveals the beauty, that's a real thing. Now let me jump to another topic. I used to promote concerts. Uh, mostly within the Christian alternative realm, heavily within the Tooth & Nail records for any of, of you out there that would know. I was bringing in a band called Showbread. The lead singer would go by Josh Dyes, but his real name is Josh Porter. He wrote a book. Let me get you a little idea here. Let's see. This was his first book, The Spinal Cord perception. I purchased this book because I liked showbread and I wanted to support Josh Dyes. I got this. I went home and I read it. And it was a difficult read. And I kept telling myself, keep pushing through because when you get to that end, you're going to see that waterfall that was worth all of that trudging. So I kept pushing on, pushing and pushing, pushing through. When I got to the end of this book, it was horrible, and there was nothing there. I dug through all this pile of trash, hoping that there would be a nugget of gold in there, something that I could grasp onto and say, it was all worth it. And all I found was a greasy hamburger. It was disgusting. And I realized that you don't always get a payoff for trudging through the garbage and the hardship. Sometimes you just get a gross, greasy hamburger. So we have two examples here. We have the walking the trails and coming to a beautiful waterfall or a view 
that you could never see without all those hours and miles of hiking. Or you have a book that you read through and you come to the end and you're like, wow, that was a waste of a lot of my life. Where does Skinamarink fall on this category? Let's talk about it. Which, by the way, when I was looking up this thing about Josh Porter, I uh, discovered that he has a new book coming out. Let's see. Here we go. It's called a Death to Deconstruction, Reclaim, Reclaiming Faithfulness as an Act of Rebellion. I actually purchased this book, and I'm going to give that a go. Let's look at the, uh, let's watch a Skinner Rim Marink trailer. In this house. In this house. In this house. There you have it. Based on that trailer, it looks terrifying, does it not? In 1995, four-year-old Kevin injures himself in an incident that his six-year-old sister, Kaylee, attributes to sleepwalking. Attributes. My apologies. I can read a little bit. Kevin is taken to a hospital and brought back home. The siblings wake up in the middle of the night to find that their father has disappeared and that the windows, doors, and other objects in their house are gradually vanishing. Kevin su suggests that they sleep downstairs where they watch cartoons on television. Don't know what else they'd watch it on. They awaken to find the house still dark, hear an unexplained thumping noise, and find a chair upside down on the ceiling. Kevin then suggests their father went with mom, but Kaylee does not want to talk about their mother. This, this next part is the only thing that terrified me, and it's only because I have a very small bladder. The toilet in the downstairs bathroom disappears. On the way to up, up to the upstairs bathroom, Kaylee sees a doll on a bedroom ceiling, and Kevin ends up too frightened to use the toilet. No joke. So they decide to place two buckets in the downstairs bathroom. <laughs> a mysterious voice calls to Kaylee from the darkness and tells her to come upstairs, where she sees their father in a bedroom. He tells her to look under the bed. No, thank you but she does not see anything. E either do we. She then sees their mother sitting on the bed. Her mother says that she and their father love Kaylee and Kevin and instructs her to close her eyes before vanishing. Kaylee looks at the open closet and hears her mother say, there's something here. From the closet, she hears her mother calling her name as well as moans of pains and bones breaking. I did not gather that at all. She is startled by a hand reaching around the corner and panics. Kaylee runs downstairs where Kevin helps her push the couch to block off the hallway <laughs> from which the voice was calling her. When Kevin falls asleep, the voice calls Kaylee again. When Kevin wakes up, he sees that Kaylee is gone and toys and objects are suspended against the wall. The voice beckons Kevin into the basement. What the? Who's doing this? Who's, who's doing this? What four-year-old is walking in the basement to some unknown voice calling it in the dark? Not happening. <clears throat> Where he sees Kaylee, who no longer has eyes or a mouth. The voice tells him it wants to play as some of the toys begin to disappear. 
a drawer opens in the kitchen, and Kevin complies with the voice, <laughs> the voice command that he insert a knife into his eye. I, I heard when I watched this movie, I heard the voice tell him this, but there was no indication whatsoever that he stuck a knife in his eye. In my personal opinion, Kevin calls 911 and whispers to the operator that he was cut with a knife and feels sick. The operator tells him to stay on the line and the adults are on their way. Kevin say, says that the doors have disappeared before dropping the phone. That all happened. He did call 911. He did tell him he cut himself, but there was no panic in his voice. There was no like, uh, I don't know what to do. It, it sounded like he just kind of cut his finger a little bit on a knife. I literally have no clue that he jabbed a knife in his eye, despite the fact that the voice told him that that's the only indicator. That's it. And then later on, they, they like show some blood on a door. And I'm like, where did this blood come from? It made no sense to me. The phone turns into a chatter phone. That's one of those toys, a phone that had the eyes on it. And the voice claims responsibility for this, telling Kevin that it can do anything. It says that Kaylee disobeyed it and demanded to see her parents, so it took away her mouth. It tells Kevin to come upstairs. Holding a flashlight, Kevin finds himself on the ceiling. He walks into a bedroom, which becomes a void, and a dollhouse is shown sitting in a pile of toys in a seemingly infinite hallway as on-screen text reads, 572 days. A woman is seen sitting on a bed, and her head slowly fades away, followed by the rest of her body. Photos are shown of people, except their faces are either missing or distorted. Kevin cries out as blood splatters onto the floor, then disappears and splatters repeatedly. This was the most absurd and stupid scene. Never mind. He asks if he can watch something happy, followed by an apparition of a door. In the dark, an unidentifiable face appears over him in his bed, telling him to go to sleep. Kevin asks for the face's name twice, but it does not respond. Let me tell you, if you're interested in this movie, what I just read you is way better than the movie. Everything there made this movie so much more clear than the actual movie. None of that, not a single bit of that, did I gather from watching the movie myself. I understood that there was two children, and I understood that there was a mother and a father. Oh, let me get back. <laughs> okay, so my cousin visits me. She's like, you got to watch this. I say, okay. This was back in November. I start watching it. After like 40 minutes, I'm just like, this movie sucks. And I stopped watching it. Now I wanted to connect with my cousin. And so there was this part of me, and I'm also somewhat of a completionist. There's a part of me that wanted to finish it so I could, you know, discuss with her and we could connect and bond over this movie. Now this somewhat ties back to that book and the walking the trails. This movie did not have a waterfall at the end. This movie was a big greasy burger at the bottom of a pile of trash. What reading that book by Josh Porter to taught me was if you get the feeling that something isn't going somewhere and you're just wasting your time, it's okay to stop. You don't have to keep watching it. You don't have to keep reading it. Owen Gilberman of Variety wrote, I found Skin and Rink terrifying. But it's a film that asks for and rewards patience. No, this does not reward you. This is a boring, boring movie. So I stopped watching it after 40 minutes. It is now six months later. I told my cousin that I would finish watching this movie and then we could discuss it. Six months later, I finally resubscribed to Shudder. It's still sitting there in my continue watching. I open it up, and to my horror <laughs> was that there was still like an hour and 15 minutes left of this movie I had to sit through. But I'm glad it's over. 
if there is any kind of silver lining to this, it's the fact that I do get to talk to my cousin. We get to bond over this. So Skin of a Rink is a movie that was directed by Kyle Edward Ball. He's a Canadian. <clears throat> he also had a YouTube channel where uh, he would have people write in their nightmares and then he would film them. I'm not going to lie that if you were a child and you watch this movie, you're never sleeping again. You would have to have some kind of a childhood trauma for this to really impact you, in my opinion. It, it didn't impact me. I said it once, said it again, and it's boring. This had a budget of $15,000. $15,000. Apparently, Kyle went to his childhood home. His mom still had saved some of his old toys, him and his sister. And uh, they spent, like, no money on lighting. They just, whatever was sitting around, basically, most of it was uh, lit from a t TV screen, which, by the way, if you uh, are prone to seizures that are triggered by lights, this will do it. The flickering of the television almost gave me seizures. I, I say that jokingly, but they, I was like, wow, this is crazy, the flickering of the, the television in this thing. Back to the budget, $15,000. And it grossed over $2 million. So good on you, Kyle. So you had a vision, you pulled it off, and there are some people that think it's ingenious. I'm not one of those people, but I still respect you 100%. At the end, in that plot uh, synopsis, it says that at one point, the words 572 days appears on the screen. And I'm like, this is just so random. What, what does this have to do with anything? There are some theories. Now, I, I never gathered this. I never would have thought about this. I'm just looking at this movie thinking this is as boring as it can possibly get. Please hurry up and be over. Get me to a place where I can understand something makes sense. It never did. It never did. Other than you got kids. Apparently there's some kind of a entity in there. You don't know. But there is a theory because Kevin falls at the beginning and has to be taken to the hospital. There's a theory that he was in a coma for 572 days and everything in the movie is really going on in Kevin's head. I personally like that theory because that's the only way that this movie makes sense. What child prompted by some random voice is going to stick a knife in their eye? Yes, children are stupid. There is a possibility. But what I think is even less possible than sticking a knife in their eye is following a voice into a dark basement, into a dark upstairs, into a dark anything. There's clearly electricity in this home. The TV's running, there's night lights. Why don't they ever turn on the freaking lights? They'll carry a flashlight around, but flipping a switch on the wall, that's too freaking difficult. Did I like this movie? I loved it. It was fantastic. I'd watch it again and again and again. Recommend it to everybody. The name, Skin and Rink, where did that come from? According to this, a children's song. <laughs> There you go, a sweet child song. Now, from what I read, he changed the spelling so that children would not accidentally come across his movie, which, you know, I'm grateful to Kyle Ball for that, having a little foresight, and I, and I appreciate him for wanting to protect the children. I, I don't know what else to say about this movie. It was slow. It was boring. It didn't reward you for your... Uh, patience and that's all it was was this was a practice in patience with no kind of reward other than knowing that you had the patience to sit through it or like in my case you're able to discuss it with somebody and that brings some kind of a joy to you Whew, where how to rate this movie man that's 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 tough it's so boring i will never ever watch it i never even wanted to finish it Mm. Would I watch this over Terrifier? Whoa. 
whoa, I did not think I would ever come to a movie that would, oh my gosh, I thought I would watch anything over Terrifier. This is literally, I, I don't know. I don't know. Skin and Marink or Terrifier? Man. Wow. Wow. This is a tough one. Ooh, and I hate Terrifier so much. And I would hate to say that I would watch Terrifier over this because I wouldn't. But at the same time, this movie is so long and boring. Ooh, it's a tough one. Give me your thoughts. Would you watch Skin and Marink or Terrifier? Which one would you rather watch? Because that's a tough one for me. This is this is a boring movie. I don't like it. Uh, good for Kyle. Uh, I hope he's able to do more feature lengths. I don't wish anything evil on him. I hope that he's able to craft more stuff. I'd give this maybe a two. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody unless out of a joke. And then we could just discuss it. But it, it's difficult. This has been Creepin' Real. I am Judah. Thanks for watching.